Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the 14th meeting in 2017 of the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee. I would ask everyone to ensure that their mobile phones are on silent. No apologies have been received. The first item on the agenda is the decision on taking business in private. The committee is to, co is to consider the stage one report on the seatbelts on school transport bill at agenda item four and at future meetings, and it is asked that we could do this in private. Are all members agreed? agreed. That is agreed. The second item on the agenda is the digital strategy, and we'll be hearing evidence on the digital infrastructure elements of the Scottish Government's digital strategy, which was published in March. I'd like to welcome the Cabinet Secretary, Fergus Ewing. I'd also like to welcome Robbie McGee from the Broadband Policy Team Leader, and Alan Johnson, Head of the Connectivity, Economy and Data Division at the Scottish Government. <clears throat> Before I ask Mr Ewing if he'd like to make an opening statement, I would just say uh, to all members and, and uh, those giving evidence, we have a lot of questions. And if we are to get, get through all the questions um, with answers, I would ask people to ask short questions and, and prompt short answers. On the basis of that, Cabinet Secretary, uh, I would invite you, if you'd like, to make a two-minute opening address uh, to the committee. Well, uh, thank you, Convener. Um, the digital strategy we published in March is, is one for Scotland. It sets out our vision of Scotland as a vibrant, inclusive, open and outwards-looking digital nation. And it sets out the actions we'll take to put digital at the heart of everything we do. It's not just about digital connectivity. It's about the provision of high-quality, world-class digital infrastructure, uh, and this clearly underpins what is in our strategy. We'll talk in the course of this session about Scottish Government-led activity in this area, the success of the Digital Scotland programme, and our emerging Reaching 100% and Mobile Infill initiatives. And it's worthwhile just recapping three elements of the success. First of all, uh, thanks to the work the Scottish Government commissioned around 715,000 homes and businesses that would not otherwise have been connected can now access fibre broadband as a result of the Digital Scotland Superfast prog uh, Broadband Programme. Second, around 3,700 cabinets have been stood across the country with live cabinets in every local authority area. I understand that the term have been stood is not a grammatical infelicity, but the correct technical term about what you do with a cabinet. And third, over 7,000 kilometres of access cabling has been laid, enough to stretch convener from Edinburgh to Florida, and 400 kilometres of subsea cabling laid to enable connectivity. So, Quite a lot has been achieved. It wouldn't have been achieved if we hadn't led the way. Uh, but it is important to acknowledge that telecoms is in fact a reserved area. I checked this myself. Schedule 5, Scotland Act 98, reserved to the UK. The UK government, convener, were responsible for doing all this, but we decided we were not prepared to wait. We don't have the powers to regulate or legislate, and that does make it more challenging to deliver our objectives. In the past week, we've seen the UK Parliament approve a bill that will introduce a universal service obligation for broadband. That was a unique opportunity to ensure that every part of the UK was able to access high-speed broadband. Ofcom's view was the cost of introducing a super-fast USO at 30 megabits per second was broadly similar to a 10 megabit per second USO. I wrote to Matt Hancock, uh, the lead UK minister on three occasions since last October uh, and I have urged the UK government to take the logical decision to commit to a super fast USO. That could have enabled the Scottish government investment to raise the bar further in Scotland and focus on delivering ultra fast broadband. Unfortunately the UK government has chosen the short sighted option and set the USO at just 10 megabits per second. That is a missed opportunity uh, convener. And it does demonstrate how the reserve nature of telecoms can often undermine our policy ambitions here in Scotland. Mr Ewing, uh, uh, what I don't want to do, if I, if I may, is miss the opportunity of allowing the committee members to ask questions. So could I ask you to draw it to a close at that stage so I, we can move on to the questions? 
Well, there's a lot of work we're doing, but if I'm not permitted to describe it, then I'll just say that uh, I think in Scotland we have very high ambitions. We've achieved a lot already. That's been remarked on favourably by both Audit Scotland and by Ofcom as doing better, faster than down south. But we are constrained by the lack of engagement with the UK government, and I'm very happy to give details about that lack of engagement, if so asked. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Yane. The first question is from Rhoda. Um, you talked about in your opening statement about the regulatory framework um, and discussions with the UK government and Ofcom about changes to the. What changes are you seeking to the regulatory framework to address Scotland's needs? Well, the, the, the regulatory framework is, is really critical for both internet and for mobile, because if you think about it, um, commercial companies will do what's profitable. They will provide services where there are customers. Now, that means cities and towns, does it not? And therefore, only by regulation uh, can mobile operators and interface, uh, internet uh, installers and providers be required to cover the parts that the commercial operators would otherwise not reach. This, this is a simple statement of fact. And the problem about regulation thus far in the UK is that the UK, because it makes money out of, for example, auctioning spectrum, has decided to have an ultra-light regulation. And that's why there is such a severe lack of coverage in mobile and broadband in the UK. And it's not, incidentally, the approach other European countries have taken. They've said, uh, take an outside-in approach, regulating, requiring the operators, requiring the broadband provider to reach out for people in rural areas who, without access to broadband and mobile, of course, are in many cases prevented, convener, from actually running a business at all or their personal life. So, you know, that's one aspect. I don't know if Mr. Johnson or Mr. McGee would like to deal with the, the question in any other way. Yeah, I mean, certainly in, in our response to Ofcom's recent strategic review of digital communications, we suggested that as a starting point, they should look to, to undertake more extensive regional market analysis. And I guess that would be to determine levels of provision, and I guess most importantly, to determine if there are specific factors that are contributing to poorer quality service in certain parts of the country. And I guess that would go beyond what's included in Ofcom's Connected Nations report and would focus more on qualitative elements. And I guess what we'd propose was that from that base position, um, Ofcom could then determine whether there are new national um, remedies or more focused regional ones that might help to, to address the problem. So we would still very much like to see Ofcom take that position more clearly. Um, we continue to engage with them, and I guess it is important to, to recognise we actually have really good engagement with Ofcom, and that's been further strengthened by the, the Memorandum of Understanding that's been signed recently. So, um, so again, it's, we understand that regional approaches can be more complex for Ofcom to manage in some respects. Um, but that complexity might well be a price worth paying if it, if it leads to, to improved communications in, in parts of Scotland. One of my concerns was that we have no map of fibre in Scotland. Um, and given that an awful lot of that fibre has been paid for by the public purse one way or another, um, and we sometimes are not using it and don't have access to it. I mean, is there something that we can do here to regulate access and indeed force... Um, operators to use fibre that's already been laid by the public person and indeed recoup the ownership of that fibre because we've paid for it. Um, it just seems a bit much that we are paying for it again and again and again. Yeah, I mean, certainly the, the I guess the constraint here is just the, the fact that, as has already been discussed, we, we don't have the powers to regulate, so we don't have the powers to compel um, suppliers to, to really do anything in this area. Um, we do recognise, though, that having a, a, a good quality, extensive knowledge of what fibre is out there is really important. So we kind of initiated a project within Scottish Government uh, a couple of years ago um, that we're working with the Scottish Futures Trust on to extensively map fibre networks across Scotland. Um, I guess, unfortunately, a lot of that information was provided under NDAs. It's been deemed commercially sensitive by operators, so it's become a really, really useful internal tool for Scottish Government, but one that we are constrained in putting out in the public domain. But again, I think it probably does reiterate the just some of the limitations that, um, that, that are linked to the reserve nature of, of telecoms. Stuart, you had a brief follow-up. Uh, 
Yes, this is a complex area. I'll be trying to make it very simple. Um, I understand that uh, the fibre itself is actually a quarter of the price of copper. The price I got this morning was 96 pence a metre, whereas copper is £3.50 a metre. Um, but conduits is the real issue, I, I suspect, and the kit that's at the end of the lines. And I just wonder to what extent you've explored uh, how we can best make sure that the conduits, or poles for that matter, or overhead poles, are capable of being used by multiple operators. So if, if it's appropriate there's competition or people want dark fibre can get it slung up there and so on and so forth, and access to the equipment at the end of the, the fibre, because it strikes me the fibre, we're being a little simple in just talking about the fibre, which is actually quite cheap. Uh, well, it's, it's, uh, I think it's a fair point to, to, to make that uh, it's the, the, the laying of the, the conduits often over very long distances for rural connections and island connections that uh, it brings in curse the, the huge cost. And uh, it, this, this is not a, a, a new uh, problem. It's, it's one that Ofcom have, have uh, wrestled with. Um, OpenReach has been offering a similar physical infrastructure access product for some years, for example, as a matter of fact, and has developed an enhanced um, uh, PIA, physical infrastructure access style solution, has been trialled by uh, some providers and has informed some recent proposals. Um, and indeed, a, in rural Scotland, the need for cooperation is particularly pronounced, and this convener was something I raised with uh, uh, the new or recent, recent, uh, uh, recently appointed chair of OpenReach, who visited here at my request just last week, uh, and discussed the con further cooperation between all the companies involved, not just operating in sort of twin sets, but but uh, more pronounced cooperation, collaboration, with a view to cutting costs. Um, and the second point I make is and this is one that may pervade the conversation, is that when we think of, of, uh, of inserting uh, uh, conduits and, and laying fibre for access to broadband, we shouldn't think of it like a roads project or a schools project because it's a public-private project. Uh, traditional procurement for roads and public buildings is paid for by the taxpayer. But here, in order to get the best price, we need to work in tandem with the commercial operators. And that means getting the best price from them. And that may later, I'm afraid, play some limits on what I can say about cost estimates and so on. But it, it is a different uh, model of laying infrastructure. It's public-private, and we must bear that in mind. For example, you know, it's, the, it, it's not the taxpayer's job to fund the provision of mobile or internet services in cities where, frankly, commercial operators already do that and make a good return. Where, where our money in Scotland and the UK comes in and is required is to get the other parts that commercial operators wouldn't otherwise reach, the rural parts and the island parts. And sadly, that's where we've really been badly let down by, by the UK government. Uh, Mr Hancock is the current minister, although despite uh, having written to him on numerous occasions and sought a meeting with him last October, he has not uh, thus far been amenable to arranging one. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Can I just remind everyone again, I will do my utmost to, to keep this moving. So far, that's the first question, and, and it's taken eight minutes to answer. We've got in excess of 27 questions. We could well stray into beyond lunch if we don't keep the answers short. So I would like to move on to the next question, and Richard, I think you're next. Well, I've got quite a long one, but I'll try and keep it short. Um, Scottish Government states it will develop, test and make decisions based on uh, robust models of investment, drawing on the very latest international data on e economic and social digital value, connectivity. What data will the Scottish Government be using? Um, well, the, the, the data we're using to inform the decisions about the procurement of the of the broadband facilities or the economic benefits that flow therefrom? Economic benefits. The economic yeah. benefits. Okay, well, I, I think it's the case earlier that the Scottish Futures Trust uh, commissioned a report uh, from memory, I think it was Deloitte's. Um, so it was a report from a major firm, and, and I believe from something I read earlier, it's just been, yeah, it's uh, 
uh, yeah, my memory is correct, the, the, the estimated benefit of digitalisation, Scotland becoming properly connected, <coughs> switched on country, uh, would be in the order of £13,000 million per annum. Now, that's an enormous figure. Um, I, I haven't got the breakdown of that figure here, but, but I think if one applies the knowledge that we have as representatives, we know that businesses that are not able to access the internet, for example, in tourism, well, how can you advertise vacancies other than through the internet if you're running a B&B &B even, or a self-catering establishment? I think all of us, particularly those of us who represent rural constituencies, are extremely aware of the constraints in this modern business era that lack of such access has. Um, and correspondingly, the ability to attract businesses, uh, some very large businesses, uh, is of course enhanced considerably by the, uh, uh, by the presence uh, and the active, successful, efficient operation of both broadband and mobile. In other words, companies will come to a country that is connected. Increasingly, I think, uh, convener, companies may not be so inclined to do business, to locate investment in countries that are not connected. And that really, I think, uh, is one of the reasons why our R100 programme is, is so important. Cabinet Secretary brought up the factor of uh, mobile phone. Um, a, a quick question on this. I asked a question last week of Ofcom. How much will the UK government make off the, the new sale of 5G? Have we any idea? Many billions of pounds. I, I don't... Well, that's asking me to predict what, what is going to be bid at an auction, the parameters for which are not yet set. I mean, what I would say is that you know, if the laissez-faire, open market, hard right approach is taken, uh, then they will get a hell of a lot of money. But if the approach that I hope members would agree here in Scotland is taken, that we protect and think of the provision for our rural and island areas, they will get a lot less. I think that's the principle. I've raised this with Matt Hancock, convener, but sadly he won't meet with me to discuss it, which is extremely disappointing. Thank you. Know any the next question is from Stuart. Uh, thank you. I, th I think we've partially covered uh, the first part of my question, which is simply how competitive are we uh, internationally in terms of uh, what is available, particularly in uh, urban areas, uh, to people. But equally, uh, I'll, I'll ask the, a second bit, which is related but slightly different, uh, and that is about making sure that new buildings, wherever they are in Scotland, are digitally ready. Are we exploring ways in which that can be achieved using the planning system, the business rates system, or, or other ways of promoting that as, a, as, a, as, as something that we actually achieve? Uh, and, of course, that complements the idea that we become more competitive. Uh, yeah, well, yes, we, we are um, ensuring that uh, new buildings are, are digitally ready. And, for example, as a matter of technical uh, information, convener, from the 1st January this year, adjustments to the building regulations set a standard for in-building physical infrastructure for high-speed electronic communications. This enables easier installation of fibre at any time and applies to all new homes and other buildings in Scotland. And we've raised this with major suppliers and they are being proactive. For example, OpenReach now offers to provide fibre to premises connectivity to developments of 30 properties or more and have a tariff proposal for smaller housing developments. The, these are all measures that I've encouraged working with the commercial operators involved and we work very closely with them. And we, we've also seen um, companies such as City Fibre commit to deliver a new gigabit fibre networks in Glasgow, Edinburgh, Aberdeen, Stirling and Virgin Media, whom I met fairly recently, have announced significant new investment to expand its coverage footprint in the cities. Hyber Optic has also delivered investment in full fibre networks in Glasgow and Edinburgh. And we were, in, I think in June last year, a, a convener, we published a mobile action plan, first in the UK, and that is designed to encourage mobile operators to come to Scotland, erect more masts to enable wider mobile coverage to deal with uh, other aspects such as infill. And the mobile action plan deals with speeding up planning permission, extending permitted development rights, uh, and uh, I'm discussing further with uh, mobile operators and others how to build on that plan to extend it so that Scotland is the most attractive place for these operators to build 
new masts. And uh, I think there are a great number actually in planning at the moment. So 7, I think it's several thousand, but we'll get back to you on that once we've uh, found the figure. Me, do you, did you want to come in on, on, on a specific part of that question? Thank you, Convener. Just a very brief <laughs> follow-up uh, as an extension of uh, Stuart's question. In the digital strategy, it says that uh, the Scottish Government will use Scotland's business rate system to incentivise the commercial delivery of new fibre and mast infrastructure. Uh, I just wondered if the Cabinet Secretary could expand a bit more on that proposition. Um, well, obviously, we want to make sure that, uh, that uh, we are an attractive location for further digital connectivity. Uh, and therefore, we, we are looking to work with the commercial operators involved to consider how the business rates uh, uh, system uh, deals with that. Uh, and of course, the Barclay Review is nearing completion, uh, convener, and, I, and I, I would imagine that Ken Barclay, that's something that he will have looked at and be report, reporting on. But in principle, we want to use the business rate system so that, at the very least, we are not, uh, uh, if you like, uh, uh, uncompetitive with other parts of the UK. I think, in principle, that's, the, that's uh, a sensible uh, approach to, to uh, uh, adopt. I mean, there's also other aspects that are equally important. For example, cells, cells uh, being affixed to public buildings as a tariff that's applied to these. Uh, and I am aware that some of the tariffs that are being proposed down south appear to be pretty um, substantial, if possibly regarded by exorbitant to some of the providers involved. So that's another area where we're looking to a work with business. The principle being, if you work with companies, then you avoid the problem that the UK government ran into when it intended to set to create, I think, 84 mobile mass in the UK and end up, uh, end up, ended up with three because they failed to speak to business. They didn't meet industry. They didn't engage with industry. So they got it all wrong. Come back on a, a I've just got a very small specific point about whether we at a commercial level are competitive internationally. Uh, I find it very confusing, but I have got numbers. The installation of fibre uh, up to two kilometres, three and a half thousand pounds. I understand in Sweden it's more like one thousand pounds. Uh, and uh, for rental for dark fibre, and these are just isolated bits I've picked out of a morass of information. Uh, the annual rental for that looks like two and a half thousand, whereas I understand in many other European countries it's about a fifth of that. Uh, is are our infrastructure providers really up to the mark internationally? Because, you know, government can only do so much. Um, are the, the suppliers doing enough? Well, I think that, you know, that's a whole series of absolutely apposite questions that do get to the root of things. And, you know, I have met with companies that are involved in the nitty-gritty of, laying, of uh, laying the conduits, uh, uh, installing the, um, uh, the apparatus, including erecting the masts, and obviously, the higher the costs, the, the, likelihood, the, the, the lower the likelihood of achieving the coverage that we wish. So this is, this is crucial. Uh, and uh, uh, th these are areas that we work closely with, the, with the, all of the operators. Um, it's, it's also important that we train up people to be able to do the work. Because you know, if, we want, if we want to install provision in the Western Isles, you know, if we don't have people in the Western Isles who are trained sufficiently, then they need to be ferried in and live in temporary accommodation. And these are practical issues too that we need to think of very carefully indeed, and we have, with working with companies. Um, significant commercial investment in mobile is currently taking place by the four operators. And broadly, I can share with you, convener, that around 8,000 existing mast locations are being or will be upgraded for 4G. And of these, 70% are shared between operators EE is building 330 new masts in Scotland as part of its 4G rollout and to serve the new emergency uh, services uh, net, uh, network requirements. And I've, I've discussed this in a meeting with, with, uh, with EE and with other mobile operators. So a lot is being done, and I get the impression that there, there is a, uh, an open-door approach with most local authorities that are very keen to accommodate this work and to have the work done. 
you know, without uh, protracted delays for planning permission where that's required. So, um, so there's good team working in Scotland to achieve the extension of mobile coverage, which, you know, is such a bugbear for some communities uh, uh, that, uh, such as uh, uh, Gail Ross represents, that uh, are challenged digitally in that regard. Uh, the next question is from Fulton. Yeah, thanks, Kim. Any cabinet secretary? I think you've you, you've you've more or less um, answered the the question I was I was uh, going on in, in terms of new build areas that weren't digital ready, and I've actually got specifically uh, in my constituency, Coatbridge and Christen. The Christen end of that constituency um, has seen a lot of new developments over the last couple of years, and since becoming an MSP, I've had quite a lot of queries about you know the the, the connectivity um, and the broadband in these areas. So I'm just wondering what more the Scottish Government can do, if anything, uh, to help um, communities such as that. I, and I appreciate that you, already your answers to Stuart Stevenson and Jamie well, Green well, have talked about that. I, I have uh, mentioned the building regulations being changed to be a sort of driver of good practice and in, in installation. I think that's sensible. Um, and there's provision for developments with under 30, which uh, probably would affect rural areas. Um, you know, we we, uh, we we are in receipt, of course, of, of complaints regarding some new developments, and I frequently myself take them up directly with Brendan Dick of, of BT, and uh, I have to say he's, he's extremely helpful in having these these dealt with. So I think in a small country we, we can uh, give people a prod, and a, I think it's the role of province of governments to do that where there's you know, and Mr. McGregor raises a very salient issue. You know, if a development goes up and there's no access to broadband, I mean, frankly, people get pretty hacked off, don't they? Uh, so, so there is that element. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm in the committee's hands. I would be very keen to hear committee's views about what else we could usefully do within the range of our powers, convener. But, of course, the, the setting of a, a properly ambitious USO is something that the, we rely on the UK government to do, and although they haven't been willing to meet with me, uh, they don't appear to be too keen on setting an ambitious target, which is sad. Just covered. Jamie, uh, you, yours is the next question. Uh, just a quick question on um, one of the uh, comments in the digital strategy. It's on page 22, uh, uh, and I can quote directly from it. Uh, the uh, Scottish Government would like to extend international fibre links. Uh, reducing our reliance on London and building greater resilience and diversity into our networks. Sounds like quite a, an intriguing uh, prospect. I just wondered uh, if uh, any, any of the witnesses had any more detail on what these uh, fibre links might look like, where they might be, how much it might cost. Uh, I, I'm acutely aware that there's very limited scope for international fibre links outside of London, Dublin, for example, in this part of the world. So. Uh, it sounds like quite an ambitious uh, uh, thing to, to tackle, but one that might be, you know, uh, quite quite a, a big uh, piece to, to buy off. So I'm just wondering if you could share more detail on that. Um, well, I, I think that uh, the, the reason we mentioned that is because we, we should set high ambitions. And uh, Mr. Green, convener, mentioned Ireland, and I understand that Ireland has developed a direct fibre link to USA, and data can therefore be transferred instantly. And I'm told that. Uh, uh, a data round trip from Port Rush in Ireland to the financial district in Manhattan takes 66 milliseconds. I'm also advised that one of the reasons that HBO took the decision to film Game of Thrones in Ireland was that the direct fibre connectivity enabled them to carry out pre-production work in real time with US pr producers, allowing scenes to be reshot uh, before the scenery was broken down and removed. So. Um, these are interesting examples, are they not? And I think they, they give a flavour of the, of the opportunity, the real opportunities that they are, if Scotland is able to uh, develop links of this nature and not simply connect ourselves in Scotland to the net. So uh, just to follow up, I, I don't disagree with anything the Cabinet Secretary said, but my question was around the detail of, uh, of the proposal. So uh, what sites are being looked at? Uh, how much do you think this might cost? When might it be implemented? Well, um, you know, it's obviously far too early to, to say what costs would be of any project that you haven't uh, scoped out and got to a certain stage, but the plainly costs would be substantial. We don't, at the moment, have definitive plans to intervene because I think our first duty in R100 is to connect our own homes and businesses to the internet, and people would perhaps look askance if we 
uh, spent uh, a taxpayers' money uh, before we've achieved that connectivity. So I think our R100 is correct. Um, but uh, uh, we, we have, uh, however, recently announced a £500,000 support to bolster IX Scotland, the first internet exchange in Scotland, and a key piece of infrastructure to support future growth. And as you know, convener, I don't like to go on, so I'm very happy to provide you with more information if you wish on that. Um, P Peter, I think you're next. I'll just push you a wee bit more, Cabinet Secretary. I mean, which, which countries are you looking to connect fibre to? I mean, you mentioned uh, Ireland, uh, uh, USA, but what, what are the plans to, from Scotland and to where? Well, as I say, we, I've just said a moment ago, Convener, we have no definitive plans at the moment, and I thought I, I set that out pretty clearly because I think the first duty is to connect uh, mm. homes and businesses in Scotland, and the aim of R100, and our, our headline, our, our main policy objective, is to connect all homes and businesses to, to Scotland. I think that's the right one, and you know, you can't do everything at one time, but I think I, I, the example I gave of the Game of Thrones, I think, really does actually illustrate just the nature and the excitement of the opportunity that being an independent country like Ireland, where they're able to do these things, legislate, regulate themselves, yeah, yeah. open up. Okay. Mike, I think you're the next question. Yeah. Um, last week, uh, Ofcom told us in committee that 100% superfast broadband coverage by 2021 would cost up to £250 million. Pounds. Does the Minister agree with this figure, and how much will the Scottish Government be putting in? Well, this, this is a, an extremely important question, and, and I, I, I want to be, take some care in, in answering it, and I've given some, some thought to this. Um, first of all, you know, the connection here is not, as I said, like a public sector project. When one gives an estimate of the cost of a public sector project, it's because the taxpayer pays it all. Here, the objective is actually to have private sector operators contribute as much as possible. Uh, I mean, for example, convener, the contracts I alluded to earlier, and they're a good case study because we've, we're just about completing them, aim to provide 95% uh, access to broadband by uh, the end of this year, and we're on track to doing so, and Ofcom and has uh, acknowledged our success in, in doing that. But the cost of that project, around about 400 million, um, I think around 280, correct me if I'm wrong, guys, but 280 million was the taxpayer's contribution. I think around 120, 126 was BT's contribution. Now, the point I'm making is this is not a conventional procurement. This is a public-private procurement. Uh, and obviously, we have done cost modelling, um, to answer Mr. Rumble's question directly, about what we believe the cost of the total provision would be but then that provision will need to be subdivided between public and private. Uh, and obviously I want to make sure, as the minister, that the taxpayer gets the best deal. Uh, so I, I'm not proposing to go into the outcome of the cost modeling exercise that we've done, but I'm perfectly happy to describe, because I don't want to impair commercial negotiations that uh, will be commenced later this year or early next year and brought to conclusion in the course of next year. I don't want to impair those negotiations because I don't want to give, if you like, uh, everybody involved the, the heads up as to the figures that, that we have in mind from the cost modelling and our open market review work is not quite completed yet. But it is a very important question and I appreciate Mr Rumble's quite entitled to ask it, of course. Uh, but I think we, we need to be very careful in answering it. What I would like to do, if, if there's time conveners for one of my officials to describe the cost modelling that we've done, which is designed to lay the ground and compute so far as we can what the likely range of provision should be expected to be. Yeah, I mean, I think in doing so, I think we can um, sort of differentiate in some respects the work that we've done um, and the work that Ofcom have done, because I think Ofcom's analysis was done as part of the preparatory work that they did to lay the ground for the UK government's universal service obligation. And I think what they did was they envisaged the lowest cost solution possible. So I think that has, that's obviously been a factor in terms of the, the number that's, that's come out of that. Um, as the Cabinet Secretary says, we had a different type of cost model that was built up. So we kind of, um, we looked on very much informed by costs that have come out of current programmes. We built up a detailed cost model for different parts of the country. 
um, and then extrapolate that across Scotland based on the, the rurality. And I guess one of the kind of key factors within that was looking to get a certain type of technology solution, looking to get the most future-proofed solution that we possibly can. And that, again, has been a factor that differentiates the work that, that we've undertaken with the work that, that Ofcom did. Can I just pursue this? Um, thanks for, for those responses. But the first part of my question was, did you agree with the Ofcom? I mean, that's in the public domain. Uh, the, the Ofcom um, idea that it will cost up to £250 million to deliver in Scotland. Um, I don't think we've got an answer to that. I, I would like to press you further on that, because I don't think that is commercially in confidence at all. So we've received that evidence already. I just like the, the Scottish government's response: is that, in their view, an ac in your view, Cabinet Secretary, an accurate? Uh, I, think, I think, to be fair, uh, Mr. McGee did say, as I heard him say, that the Ofcom's uh, figure was based on on the, the lowest cost solution possible. I think I did, to be fair to Mr. Mm. McGee, hear him say that uh, we don't uh, think that the cost model that Ofcom have produced is necessarily the 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 uh, best one. But I think. A little more information from Mr. McGee could be of help to the committee. Yeah, I mean, I think in, in broad terms, you know, I, I think we felt it was on the Conservative side. I know the um, UK government potentially felt that as well. But I think in broad terms, the fact that it's looking at a different type of technology solution, I think by and large, what Ofcom's analysis was based on was technologies like long range VDSL delivering a lot of the, uh, the USO component over existing copper networks. And I think. Our presumption is that the R100 programme will not be as reliant on copper networks as that. So I don't think we necessarily have any fundamental um, issues with the, the, the analysis that Ofcom did, but it was just undertaken on a different basis from the analysis that we did. But so far, and the Minister mentioned that of the 400 million spent, 280 million was from public funds and 126 million from BTs. I mean, we don't have the resources of commercial organisations, so they're well aware of all of these figures, and, and, we, <coughs> and we don't have the nitty-gritty of them. And we're just trying to, I'm just trying to dive a little bit more, because of that £280 million of public money, how much of that was from the Scottish Government's resources? Uh, yeah, I think we've, uh, we, we paid the lion's share of, of... There was a commitment, to be fair, from the UK Government, the Scottish Government, and from local authorities... Uh, and uh, a, a, uh, therefore, there, there was a, a, a united Team Scotland approach in respect of the of the provision. But you know, your question, Mr. Rumbles, is about R100, the, yeah. the estimated cost of the future project. I mentioned the cost of the past project to illustrate that this is not conventional public procurement. This is a, a public-private partnership, and you know, our aim is to get the, the maximum mm -hmm. from the private sector and the minimum from the um, public's <coughs> from the uh, pub public sector, um, and Mr. Johnson can give you the, the figures in respect of the uh, existing contract, if, if that's of use to the committee. Okay, so a couple of things to add there. In terms of the 400 million that was, that was uh, DSSB, um, between Scottish Government and Scottish local authority, it was 153 million. UK Government, 101 million. Highlands Island Enterprise, 11 million. European Union was 12. BT, between capital and operation costs, 126. The Scottish Government local authorities split within that, with Scottish Government 63, local authorities 91. If I could make one other point on the, the, the approach to R100, there's really two dimensions that come in on future cost and budget projections. One is that the precise nature of the solutions the precise nature of the solution to the R100 commitment is not yet determined. We're in discussion with contractors. We're looking, potential contractors, we're looking to see some technological innovation coming in there. There are different ways it could be done that are not yet entirely determined. So there's no surprise there are a range of different uh, cost estimates for that in, in, in the frame. They will vary depending on the solution that's ultimately chosen that is not yet determined. And as the Cabinet Secretary has said, the second dimension then is the, is the nature of the procurement, the nature of the, co the extent to which that is competitive, the extent to which that brings in private sector investment. Sorry, but just if, if I could just for a point of clarity, um, <clears throat> we talked about the figures that have been produced by Ofcom. My understanding that the figure that was quoted of 250 million was scenario three, which was the uh, most um, 
well, it was all, all bells and whistles, as it were. Um, it, was, it, was a, it was the most improved scenario. You're suggesting that it wasn't. Could you just clarify that for me, Mr McGee? Yeah, so, I mean, what Ofcom did, they obviously looked at three different scenarios, which ranged from a 10 megabits USO, which was scenario one, to, in effect, a more robust 10 megabits, which was scenario two, and scenario three, which is the 250 million pounds one, which was about 30 megabits per second uh, USO. I guess... What, if I can characterise that, and this is very broad brush, but if I can characterise that as they costed up what it would take to just achieve that 30 megabits per second. So as I said earlier, potentially looking at how they could wring every last bit out of the copper network. So it's in some cases it would be 30 megabits just, whereas I think what we've looked to do is to try and look across the piece and see, well, could we look at a more future-proofed solution, um, which would obviously enable far, far higher speeds than 30 megabits per second. Okay, just, just for clarity on the record, the figures they gave were, were, were 200 million, not 250 million, according to the notes that we've got. So I think you may have upgraded their thing as well. Sorry, sorry uh, Mike. Could I just ask another question on this? Because what I'm trying to get at, and, and the role of our, our committee is to hold the government to account. In other words, the government has made a political commitment for this 100% coverage by 2021, and we're all in favour of that. And our job really is to just try and tease out whether the government has put aside enough resources to achieve that objective realistically by 2021. And while I'm not trying to um, put at risk anything in commercial confidence, because of course the negotiations with commercial companies, they know what the Scottish government has made a commitment to. So they know that you've made a commitment to 100% coverage. What I'm trying to get at is, are you, particularly for the minister really, are, are you confident within the, the cabinet, within the Scottish government, that whatever the outcome of that arrangement is, there will be enough Scottish government resources to meet the government's political commitment by, by 2021, even though these are commercial contracts? Um, yeah, absolutely fair question. And... Um the first tranche of uh, the cost of R100 is included within uh, the budgetary provision for digital infrastructure projects of £112 million pounds in the 2017-18. I mention that because that figure is divided as between completing the existing contract and preparing and starting to fund the new contract. Uh, so I'm not really giving very much away. But I, I just I mention that because £112 million is a fairly sizable chunk of money. I mean, it's not as if it's 10 or 20 million. And therefore, you know, I think, uh, a, obviously, th this work will be done in stages, and we will no doubt report back to committee, but uh, the, the Scottish Government is recognises that the R100 project is challenging, it's ambitious, we believe it's achievable, and we have set aside uh, a, 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 in our thinking a, a, a year marking provision for future years, which we expect to be sufficient to meet um, the, the not uh, inconsiderable costs uh, involved. Um, we also incidentally envisage that uh, were we to remain within the European Union, that uh, there the would be the possibility of obtaining funding from it. Uh, so, you know, that's uh, something that's available potentially at the moment, um, and I think there is a, a, an SRDP application for backhaul in the Highlands and Islands pending. Um, officials may give more details about that if it's of interest to the, to the committee in respect of the cost of Brexit, but obviously we'd be looking for the UK government to match any EU money as, uh, as they promised they would in the event of Brexit. So, just before I bring in uh, Jamie, Cameron, etc., can I just push this slightly? Because I've, I've been to various meetings, as I'm sure uh, committee members have heard, uh, have as well, regarding the costs of delivering the last 5% in the Highlands. And, I mean, we, we, we've got a figure here uh, from Ofcom. We've also uh, heard a figure from HIE of two to three hundred million pounds for delivering uh, in the Highlands. I've actually heard figures in excess of five hundred million pounds. Now, I understand totally that there'll be part of that will be funded by. Uh, whoever is delivering it. It won't all come from government funds. And I also understand the way the contract works, that with more connections, the, the actual cost borne by the provider will be, um, will, will be greater. What slightly concerns me, Cabinet Secretary, is that 
we all have an obligation to ensure that by 2021 everyone has access to this and we all as parliamentarians will be held to account if they don't. Uh, it concerns me that if it is as high as £600 million, which by what you're suggesting on previous contracts may be reduced to £400 million with the provider uh, funding the rest, is the government going to be in a position to come up with that money? And can the government confidently say at this stage that they believe there will be more than one person or one company tendering for the contract in the most difficult areas? Well, um, I mean, I think there's, there's lots of points. First of all, we are fairly early on in the process. Um, I think that's a reasonable point for us to make. You know, we, we are proceeding with the open market review. We've said that we're going to tender. Secondly, as you rightly say, convener, um, the way to, to get uh, the best value is by tendering and by getting, attracting competitive bids. Uh, and the contract R100 uh, is not obviously as immediately commercially attractive as supplying the City of London. I mean, it's just it's a matter of common sense. Uh, so, you know, attracting competitive bids is a task that's extremely important, uh, and it's one that uh, we've been working hard on, uh, as you would expect, in uh, seeking to identify those who may have an interest in uh, putting forward bids. So competition is really key, I think, to securing the best possible deal. Thirdly, your main point about are we putting aside enough money, I mean, I think 112 million is a fairly substantial chunk of money to set aside for digital infrastructure, particularly since, as I said earlier, the Scotland Act says the UK should really be, be picking up the tab for all of this anyway if you have a strict interpretation of the law, which as a lawyer I'm not averse to, uh, to doing in principle. Uh, uh, so, you know, I think we've really gone some way, uh, and that's for 2017-18. We've got 2018-19, 2019-20, and 2020 to 21. So we've got 112 million this year, not all of which will go to the new, uh, and we've got three further years in which to make provision for this. And obviously, in the course of those three years, I expect of the pleasure of, of uh, further grillings on this topic. Uh, do you have a follow-on to that? Thank, thank you, convener. So, uh, just uh, can I just clarify uh, Mr. Johnson's comments on the 412 million uh, DSSB? Uh, that £101 million of that came from the UK government and 62.8 from the Scottish government. Can you just clarify that for the record? Uh, yep, that's correct. Thank you. So can I ask a technical question then on, the, on, on getting to this 100%? Um, given that there is or there will be uh, a, a UK-wide USO um, in, in whichever form that manifests itself, 30 meg or 10 or whatever the final outcome of the bill is, um, <clears throat> and assuming that, that there will be contracts taken with uh, telecoms providers to provide that at a UK-wide level, is there any detail on how those contracts will work in terms of the, uh, the contracts that the Scottish Government will take to meet its R100 programme versus any UK-wide contracts that, that DCMS may take out with perhaps even some of the same providers or, or indeed a completely different provider. So I, I guess it, it's, a, it's a genuine question. I just want to ensure that, that you know, we're not sort of spending public money twice in, in some sort of way. It's just a, it's, it's a bit lack of clarity on how the, the two programmes may work simultaneously. Well, you know, I, I think it's a fair question. And, uh, you know, I, I have sought to have a collaborative approach with the UK government and partly for the reasons that Mr. Green mentions, to have an aligned approach would make sense. Um, and, you know, I don't want to labour the points before about, you know, not being able to meet with the UK minister, and I've written to him since October, but it's really pretty, pretty dire. But I have in the letters, convener, this is important because this gets to the root of how we should be working, that I've suggested that there be a working group set up involving the devolved administrations and the UK government to oversee the development and implementation of the USO. Uh, and my officials, uh, I think, were in touch with their counterparts yesterday. But, you know, officials can only do what they're bid by ministers. Uh, and so far, there hasn't really been a willingness even to enter into a workshop, which is really disappointing. Um, so I hope that, you know, uh, whatever happens after the 8th of June, that a more pragmatic, constructive approach can be adopted by the UK government, because, of course, that's how I seek to be. John, yours is the next question. Yes, thanks, Convener. I mean, 
Jimmy Green's co covered some of the question I was going to ask, um, but given that the Act that, that was passed last week has gone for 10 gigabyte, uh, megabytes, sorry, megabits, sorry, um, and the House of Lords and I think opposition in the House of Commons it wanted 30 and called the 10 a baby step and not ambitious enough, um, how does that affect the Scottish Government's plans to go for 30 me megabits? Mr Johnson wants to answer this. Uh, well, just to, I suppose it's really to reiterate the point that Cabinet Secretary made a moment ago. There's a lot to be uh, discussed there, a lot to be explored about precisely how the UK Government intends now to take forward that power that ministers possess, a result, their ministers possess a, as a result of that Act. What that will mean, I understand the a uh, minister in the UK government indicated in the committee sessions around that bill that one of the possible virtues of having that kind of power would be to encourage private sector providers, primarily OpenReach, to come forward and reach a voluntary agreement to provide that level of, um, uh, of broadband speed. So there is still much we understand to be determined about how the UK government even intend to take forward how the USO would operate in practice. Now, we're just very keen to have those discussions because clearly, as Mr Ewing says, some ways they could do that would be more consistent with and more helpful from the point of view of uh, a 30 meg commitment in Scotland than others. And we're looking to get the right approach to that. And propo we proposed again yesterday um, to, at an official level to take forward a workshop in June to take that forward. And we're hoping for a positive response to that after the election. So would the worst case scenario be that if the UK government is not forthcoming, we would not be able to achieve the 30 by 2021? No, I wouldn't say that. Uh, we, the, the commitment would remain. I don't see that as being uh, threatening to the delivery of the commitment, but it would clearly make for better use of resource all round if that could be done in, the, in a coordinated way. Okay, thank you. Um, Stuart. Um, it's a technical question, but I think it's a relevant one. Is the 10 megabit that the UK government is envisaging essentially just migrating from ADSL to VDSL, continuing to use copper with no fibre involved in the, uh, the, the upgrade to 10 megabit whatsoever? I think that would probably be a fair assessment. I mean, again, in the absence of detail, it's, it's difficult to say definitively, but I think that's probably a, a fair characterisation. That's fine. Thank you. Can, can I just ask a, a, a question in, in relation to broadband and the delivery of it? One of the problems that we all face as uh, MSPs is when this is going to be delivered and to ask when it, the Cabinet Secretary will be in a position to give indications of people when they can expect the delivery of broadband to their area so that we can therefore allow and tell constituents that they might not be getting it for two years and to come up with alternative plans. Um, well, a, well, first of all, I refer back to the uh, fact that um, you know, over 715,000 homes and businesses have been connected precisely because we did act in, in Scotland and have access to DSSB. Um, and uh, you know, I, I think that's, that's a reasonable achievement, but it's of no comfort convener to those who don't have uh, broadband. And, and I've quite fairly been quizzed on this uh, here and in the chamber. So there are, looking forward to the R100 programme, program, a number of steps that we need to complete before finalising our delivery plan. First of all, we need to complete our open market review uh, that will confirm commercial investment plans, then consult in a new intervention area, and we expect to do this uh, over the summer. And commercial investment is key. Um, extensive supplier engagement and other preparation is being undertaken to make sure we get this right. We've also set up an expert group to act as a sounding board and advise as our emerging approach to, to make sure that we're attuned with uh, industry advice in the way that we're taking the procurement forward. And once that work has been finalised, we'll set out the basis for our uh, procurement approach uh, before they launch. Um, you know, plain, plainly, the, the target and the manifesto commitment we have is, is to to complete the um, provision of access under the R100 programme by the end of this parliamentary session. Um, it, it's not, I'm afraid, possible at the moment to say, you know, if you live in X and Y or Z, when you will get connected, I'm afraid. That, that's something that we, we would have to look at later 
uh, along the line. I mean, obviously, I think what the public want is that we get this right. We get the spec right. And this is not straightforward. Uh, and that's why we're proceeding with care. I don't know if the officials have, can add anything, because I do appreciate it's a very pertinent question, convener, about the timescales. Yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, obviously, much of the detail around deployment will be linked to the completion of procurements and agreement of, of the detail of the contracts. I guess what I would say is that we're absolutely committed to being as open and transparent as we possibly can be about um, R100 deployment. I think there's, um, we've done a lot of work with the, the teams within Scottish Government and Highlands and Islands Enterprise who are managing the, the Digital Scotland contracts. Um, lots of work on, on lessons learned, and I think part of that is, is looking at how we convey information to the public, how we convey it in the most user-friendly way, how we get the most up-to-date information. I think great strides have been made in the course of the DSSB project in doing that. So we now have a situation where the most up-to-date information is available via the website, but we recognise that there are still clearly improvements that can be made, and that, that's going to influence the approach around R100 delivery. Sorry, Jamie, do you want to, to come in on that? I found that very helpful, thank you. Um, it's just So on the question of mapping, I know uh, on scotlandsuperfast.com, which uh, is, has seen great improvements of, since we since, since I joined this committee, um, <clears throat> the, 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 I think the real problem around uh, the information available to people is that it, it, a lot of it is coming up as these maps are highlighted green. In other words, it says that they're accepting orders. Uh, but when you drill down to on a premise-by-premise -premise basis, that uh, I'm getting a lot of uh, people complain that they're actually unable to, to access Superfast, even though they're connected to the cabinet, primarily due to distance to the cabinet. So when they do call up uh, the ISP, they're having problems in, in getting any sorts of speeds. But uh, my worry is that these premises are being counted as having access to Superfast. I, I, I think there are a lot of people that are falling through the net, and I think the, the, the information available to them doesn't really reflect, reflect the reality on the ground. So I just wonder what could be done to address that issue. I mean, just to be clear, I mean, if, if any, I mean, we obviously know that there are, there are issues, just the nature of the way in which the contracts have been deployed. It, is, it was very much designed to maximise coverage. We know that as a result of that, there are issues. And I, I would say, I would stress it as a real minority, but there are obviously some issues with long lines and drop-offs and speeds. But to be absolutely clear, the OMR that's been undertaken has been undertaken at a premise level. It looks at speeds delivered at a premise level. And if individual premises are unable to get 30 megabits per second, then they will be in the intervention area for R100. There's absolutely no um, sense that they will fall between the cracks in that way. Um, so I think that's a really, really important point to stress. Um, as I say, I think our approach going forward has been to look at technology solutions that do deliver a more consistent um, performance across areas. Um, and I think that will be reflected, I guess, in the, the technology solutions that are offered by suppliers. We would certainly hope that, and that's the indication that we're getting through through supplier engagement that's been underway. So just as a point of clarification, any, any premise, uh, residential or commercial, that uh, currently doesn't have access to Superfast, uh, even if it's in an urban environment or is currently in the, the mapped area of having access to a Superfast cabinet, uh, but isn't achieving the speeds, will uh, be able to take advantage of intervention under R100, therefore will have ac access to Superfast by the end of 2021? Yeah, so it will be classified as a white premise and eligible for intervention. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, the next question is on a slightly different subject, but uh, John Finney, sorry. Uh, thank you, Kavina. Uh, good morning, panel. Uh, Kavina, before I ask this question, I want to pick up on a, a comment that the Cabinet Secretary made about lack of engagement, because I, I think um, in recent weeks, even if not successive weeks, we've heard from the Cabinet Secretary on the issues of agriculture, fisheries and today's events. And our ability as a committee to scrutinise is impeded by the unwillingness of the relevant UK ministers to engage with the Cabinet Secretary. And I, I think that, on one level, is a discourtesy to the Scottish Government, but I also think it's a discourtesy to this committee. We need to have meaningful scrutiny, and I hope at some point we're going to pick up on this and, and make representations, because it, it, it's not acceptable. It simply is not acceptable. Um, and if, if, if I can just make a comment uh, that I think it's important that uh, the committee gets access to the information it needs to be able to do its job properly. So I think yeah. we're mindful, as I've told, told you before, John, uh, trying to get people up. I mean, it's a difficult time at the moment, but we'll renew our efforts as a committee uh, post the election to make sure that the right people come up to, to speak to the committee. Okay, thank you for that assurance. Uh, Kavira. Very well made, and uh, you know, would expect at least a Hancock half hour. <laughs> we can cope with a Hancock half hour just at the moment, uh, Cabinet Secretary, but uh, 
Uh, Mr. Finney, you'll get to talk about something else. Yeah, yes, it, it was about mobile access, and, and some of this has been touched on, um, Cabinet Secretary. You, you've mentioned the Mobile Co Connectivity Action Plan, and uh, can I, I commend uh, the outside-in uh, approach, um, rural, rural uh, areas before uh, um, urban areas, particularly with regard to 5G. C can I ask uh, how this, the government's mobile connectivity action plan will help with the R100 project, please? Um, well, increasingly, um, access to the internet is, uh, I think, uh, particularly those uh, uh, happily in the younger uh, uh, sort of first, uh, <coughs> first half of life are using mobile phones increasingly to access the internet. I mean, I think that's kind of a lifestyle uh, practice and is, is in trending that direction. And therefore, you know, more ob mobile coverage uh, is, I think, an enabler, I think, in general a terms. And that, that's why I'm really so keen to build on the, the, the good work that we've set out, out in the Mobile Action Plan. It is the only one in the UK. I'm not quite sure why, because it does seem quite an easy thing to, to do. There's nothing magic about it or particularly complicated about it. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I think it is the case that, you know, rather than fixed broadband connections that increasingly people are using a mobile phone, not just to access the internet convener, but to complete virtually all their transactions. And that, that, if that process continues, I think it accentuates the importance that we attach to mobile coverage. I don't know if officials want to give a more technical answer than that. Yeah, I mean, I think I mean, we do see a real interplay between the two, activity around mobile and the R100 um, project. I think there's probably two things that I would, I would pinpoint. I mean, I think, as the Cabinet Secretary has said, I think people are increasingly using mobile devices and mobile networks to access um, supervised broadband. So I think when we um, design a mobile infill initiative, which we're obviously working on with the operators, I think there is real potential there that we can use that flexibly to target areas that don't have broadband or won't have broadband delivered by the main R100 procurements. I think the other point that is crucial um, that, that demonstrates the interplay between the two is we're kind of designing the R100 procurements to look at, at real delivery of new backhaul, which is obviously the kind of trunk fibre that, that underpins you know, domestic broadband and 4G, 5G services. Um, I guess what we're aiming to do is ensure that new backhaul that's delivered through that programme is as easily accessible as possible to mobile network operators. And in doing that, it should um, make it far easier to deploy 4G and in future 5G services utilising that backhaul. Okay, thank you. Uh, a further question, and, and this may have been uh, covered. I'm maybe getting my meetings mixed up here. Uh, February of this year, uh, Mr Ewing, you approached Ofcom to see if they'd be willing to facilitate a, a, a session specifically on uh, mobile coverage. Um, are you able to give an update on that? Has that taken place at all? Uh, it, it hasn't taken place. Um, I did, uh, with officials, uh, have a very fruitful meeting at, uh, with Ofcom at their premises in the centre of Edinburgh. And it was agreed at that, that uh, meeting, which I think was around about uh, February, that we should have a further um, session with some of the commercial operators present. And uh, I've discussed that since with other operators, all of whom have agreed. So I'm hoping that that can take place um, before the summer recess, um, perhaps after the 8th of June, but before the summer recess. And the purpose really is to have a collaborative relationship with <coughs> the, the key commercial players and you know to convey the sense that we want them to do more business in Scotland that's welcome and we want to work with them and where we can do something which doesn't involve disproportionate cost then we will try to do it and the experience I have in dealing with companies is that this approach is exactly the one that most companies want they don't necessarily expect uh, more than that in terms of massive amounts of money uh, being thrown at them but they do appreciate a proactive government that's ready to reach out. So this is one of several um, a, a ways in which uh, a, we, we do that. So, um. and, and just to I could clarify there, then, uh, the, the, the two digital approaches running in parallel, the, the UK government, the Scottish government, that meeting, it, you would hope to have representatives of the UK government along at that as well? I, I did uh, uh, suggest that that would be helpful, uh, whether it's the Scotland office or uh, Mr Hancock, I don't know, but... Uh, You'll be very welcome. Okay, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Okay, sorry, can I just clarify as well on that, uh, Mr. McGee? You, you said that uh, 
I was interested the Cabinet Secretary said it was only those people in the first half of their life that used uh, mobile phones to do a lot of business. I think I do as well. But <clears throat> can I just say that I, I'm interested to know, certainly in the Highlands, there's, there's a lot of places which have no G, let alone any other sort of G, you know, 3, 4 or 5G. So the question is, is, is how much are you going to rely on, on the provision of superfast broadband via mobile phones to deliver to the last 5%? And do you think that's a reasonable way forward? Um, it could potentially be a factor. It's not at the forefront of our planning. I think it's one of, as we get into the really difficult areas where there will be a kind of variety of technology that needs to be employed, I think mobile 4G at the moment and 5G in future will have a, a part to play. That's certainly not the focus of the initial R100 procurements, but I think as one of many technologies, it's one that could be deployed in future. That's true. Um, I, I wonder, probably, Mr. McGee, given that 5G is really two different things, it's actually an urban, high-speed, high-frequency uh, implementation, but for rural areas on the 700 megahertz band, it's about area coverage at much higher than previous speeds and is technically much simpler to implement. Is there the opportunity to get that bit of 5G done quicker perhaps, than the high frequency uh, in London, Birmingham, Edinburgh, Glasgow, uh, where there are lots of technical issues and potential interference in the radio frequency with adjacent states, which simply doesn't apply to much of rural Scotland that currently has no mobile signal worth talking about. Yeah, so I mean, I think the, the 700 megahertz, um, the upcoming 700 megahertz um, spectrum auction will be really crucial. Um, and I think we're obviously engaging with Ofcom in terms of what that will look like, how it will be designed, and coverage obligations are obviously what, just one element of that. I think in terms of the wider issue of how 5G will evolve and how it will be deployed in Scotland, we are really keen for Scotland to be at the forefront of 5G deployment. Um, so we've, um, we've recently set up um, a partnership with industry, with academia, um, Scotland Innovation Partnership, which we're hoping will, will kind of morph into, in effect, a 5G hub for Scotland, where we'll really be looking to sort of use Scotland as a bit of a test bed to look at how 5G could be deployed in rural locations, um, because we don't, we're not short on those. Um, so I think um, we've made some really, really good progress with likes of EE, BT, um, Facebook, Cisco, the whole host of companies are involved in that along with universities and I think you know, we would be really, really keen to, um, we, we clearly will develop that over the, the coming months and I think crucially see it as, as a, a real potential way in to access some of the UK government funding that's been set aside for 5G development. So it's an area that we're really, really interested in. Thank you. Uh, Richard, you've got the next question. Yes, uh, Cabinet Secretary, when you came along with regards to the draft budget on the 21st of December, we spoke about um, community uh, networks across the country. Digital strategy promises to support community uh, broadband Scotland to deliver a pipeline of 16 community networks across the country with potential to connect up to 8,000 premises. Um, could you provide more detail on exactly what the pipeline will deliver and which communities possibly will get that support? Uh, yes, well, I, I think it might be helpful if I wrote the committee with full details because there are 16 projects and I uh, don't have time to go through them all. I don't have all the details in front of me, but I, I, I do know that locations range from North Sky and Fair Isle down to Berwickshire and Ettrick in the borders, and they're all at different stages of development to uh, convener, but significant pro progress has been made, and Community Broadband Scotland anticipate that the majority of these will go to procurement in the course <laughs> of this year. Uh, that's quite acceptable to me, and I'm sure to the committee. Will the promise complete the, the role of uh, uh, community, school, community um, broadband uh, in the R100 uh, project? Does the strategy promise mean that CBS will not be funded to support any additional community project? Well, we, we did uh, provide an additional £1 million of funding from, from memory this year for the Community Broadband Scotland, but we don't think it's, uh, it, will pay, it will play the central role in the procurement. I think it has a role to play, but not as the, as the primary uh, provider. But it will have an ongoing role to play in supporting community-led initiatives, and we're working with them to establish their future um, funding uh, funding needs and um, the the uh, the 16 projects referred to 
can be funded from existing resources. This includes, incidentally, convener European money, the SRDP, the Scottish Rural Development Programme. So I think it does actually show the European Union has been quite a good friend to communities, rural communities in Scotland, and a friend whose loss would, uh, would be of uh, some potential uh, damage to such future projects. Thank you. Uh, the next question comes from Gail. Thank you, Convener. Good morning, panel. Um, just to continue on the uh, CBS line, if, um, if communities know that they're going to be part of the R100 programme, why would they consider um, taking forward a community scheme with CBS? Would you still um, say that that would be a, a good option for them? And you did say, in answer to another question, that um, it was difficult to know where the R100 programme was going to roll out. But certainly in the current contract, and I know that we've discussed this at committee before, it's been very difficult for communities to know whether or not to go forward with a community scheme because they haven't known when the rollout's going to come to them. Um, and I think that that's something that we need to be reassuring our communities about. Um, so could you uh, just comment on those, please? Um, yes, well, as I think I've said, R100 will be the primary means of ensuring that rural and island communities have access to superfast broadband. And, um, you know, that, that is the, the fundamental point I've made. I mean, plainly, CBS is on hand to provide advice, um, and it's focused primarily on delivering the 16 projects that, uh, to which I have uh, alluded and details of which I will furnish the committee with. Um, uh, and I do appreciate this is, this is frustrating, and I well understand that some communities would want to press ahead now, um, but um, you know, we, we, we have to proceed in the most eff efficacious way, and we think that R100 is, is the way to do that. So I, I think it's difficult to envisage communities being given the choice, kind of uh, envisaged in that, in that question, uh, because we have a, a clear plan uh, to uh, proceed to provide R100. The other point I make is that, and it's important, I think people will appreciate this, that, that you know, installing access and fibre fiber broadband is, is not just a straightforward matter. I mean, it involves in, in any project, uh, like any other infrastructure project, a lot of work, including the survey to design, to build, to connect, and to activate. And each one of these stages, practical problems can arise. It's like any other infrastructure project. So it's important to think of it as a kind of a process that, that takes a lot of work, effort, and planning to get right. It's, it's not like, you know, um, switching electricity suppliers or something like that. It's, it's a, of a different order. No, I agree that the R100 programme is the way forward, and that's the com commitment that we've made um, to the whole of Scotland. It's just these communities that may not be connected to, say, 2021. And, you know, is there a, a solution for bridging that connectivity between now and then? Uh, R100 really is the way that we can do this. And if we, if we didn't do it this way, there would be a myriad of different, you know, hundreds of different projects. And, and I think from... From a cost point of view, it would be unlikely to be uh, affordable or, or indeed deliverable in terms of the sheer administration. I mean, I know that each of the 16 community projects is, uh, um, involves a huge amount of work. So I think we have to consider the practicalities, convener, even although I do appreciate that we are, we are asking some communities to be patient. But I, I think that is the, the best approach. I don't know if, if I've missed anything out. That I think just the, the one element I would mention is that uh, there is a scheme at the moment, the Better Broadband Scheme, which is a UK government scheme that we administer that does provide that kind of interim support. So if you've um, premises receive less than two megabits per second, um, there is funding available to, to support a solution, which is often a satellite solution or a non-superfast solution, but it could be that, that bridge between... Uh, something that's clearly sub-basic broadband and super fast that, that we would obviously hope to deliver further down the line. So it's probably worth just, just recognising that. Thank you. Um, what about, uh, there's a, a non-profit community benefit society in North England called Barn. Have you looked into doing anything similar in Scotland? Or supporting anything similar in Scotland? Yeah, I mean, the, the Barn project is obviously very prominent. I think um, highly successful, um, but quite difficult to replicate. Um, you know, there are a number of uh, factors that have led to success. Um, they're very close to a kind of core backhaul route. Um, they've also funded it through community shares, so it's, there's been no 
uh, public funding put into the, the project at all, which makes it far easier to, to get through um, in state aid terms. So we, we clearly are, we've, we've kind of, we've talked to Barn, we, we, we know the project inside out, Community Broadband Scotland has, has worked quite extensively with them to, to kind of understand if there are elements of it that can be replicated. But as ever, even we talked earlier about some of the kind of international comparisons and it is quite striking that you can look at other examples elsewhere. Very rarely do you find a model that can be transplanted wholesale into a kind of context Else, you know, out with that, that particular place. Um, but it is certainly a very, very interesting model. And I know that, um, that, that Barn themselves have been quite active in terms of establishing a backhaul presence in Scotland as well, which may mean that they can support other community projects in future. Okay, thank you. Right, who wants to come in on that? Yes, um, I'm a little concerned about um, the statement about Community Broadband Scotland. Am I correct that the projects that they are funding now will be the last projects they fund? And what hope is there, if that's the case, for communities who can't wait for another four years? Yeah, I mean, I don't think we wouldn't characterise it as those being the last projects that Community Broadband Scotland will fund. I mean, I think... Um, we, we clearly, I don't think it would be helpful to have a kind of plethora of community projects springing up in development at a point when we're about to go for, for large-scale procurements. But I think we do still see CBS absolutely as having a, a long-term contribution to make and a really important one um, because we anticipate that the initial R100 procurements will go so far in terms of delivering super-fast access. I think Community Broadband Scotland then has a key role in future phases in terms of pushing coverage further in various ways, linking communities into the new backhaul that we're going to create. And I think that's a really important element of uh, the way that we're going to structure procurements is setting up um, accessible points of presence that communities are then able to, to access. And I think Community Broadband Scotland can play a really, really important role in providing support, advice and indeed funding to communities further down the line. But I think it makes sense that there is an element of CBS kind of consolidating around its current project pipeline rather than going out at the moment, and it is very much distress at the moment, um, rather than going out and, and trying to, to, to add to that pipeline while there's obviously large-scale procurement activity planned. So communities who are looking to do something now need not apply, or should they apply? I mean, it just seems a bit, what you're saying is a bit vague as to where communities, you know, some of them are already working on things. If this has been withdrawn and they have to stop, then I can imagine a huge amount of frustration. I think, I mean, it's, it's not a case of the, the door is by no means closed. I think we would stress that communities that are in that position continue to engage with Community Broadband Scotland and continue to, to obviously get advice and support from them. I think it would then be very much a kind of discussion around where that community is, what the circumstances of it are. If there, if there looks to be a real opportunity to fund something there, then it's absolutely something that CBS still could look at. But I think the default position from our point of view is that it would start to just complicate things a little bit if we were to fragment the intervention area that we put to the market through R100. So I think the message is for communities in those situations, continue to engage with CBS. They are more than willing to continue that dialogue. But I think we just need to be mindful that there is large scale investment coming down the, coming down the track through the R100 programme. And you know, that has to be a factor in terms of CBS's investment profile over the next couple of years. Okay, and just one, one final question yes. on that. Given that CBS has funded and there are community-owned and run um, broadband projects there, will they be taken into the R100 so that there is kind of going forward, there is upgrades, there's management of the system, is there the opportunity for those communities to make that part of um, the larger network rather than continue to run it themselves into the future? I think it depends. I think, um, I mean, we don't, for example, see that community networks um, will kind of come through the, the R100 process. I think that the procurements, the initial procurements certainly are going to be targeted far more at kind of larger operators, suppliers that can operate at scale. I think CBS has done a lot of work with community broadband projects across the country just to look at sustainability issues um, and to determine, um, I guess, procedures that, that ensure that, you know, if circumstances within a community move on, that there is a kind of sustainability that the lights can be kept on in terms of um, services, etc. So it's, there's been a lot of work done by Community Broadband Scotland in conjunction with the universities in Edinburgh and Stirling, just looking at the sustainability of community networks, things that could be done just to kind of enhance that. So I think this is an area where CBS have been, been quite active. Um, but in terms of the actual R100 procurements, I think they're going to be of a scale 
that will be beyond community broadband networks initially. Peter. Yeah, uh, just carry on the CBS stuff. We've heard that uh, there's a scheme going on in Glen Lyon, and the, the folks there are, are concerned that the supplier that CBS are working with to actually deliver the service are, are, are quite a small company, and, and they're concerned that they may not be financially robust. So what happens if, in the event of, of this uh, supplier going bankrupt, bankrupt is, the, is the government going to underwrite that and are they going to help to uh, get, you know, ensure that the going forward there is still a, there is still a service to, to some of these areas? Um, well, we, we work uh, with Community Broadband Scotland to ensure sustainability and to determine effective procedures in respect of procurement and uh, to enable service continuity where there are financial difficulties and the CBS model has tended to support community-owned networks convener, which makes it easier to cover such an eventuality, whether by retendering for an alternative supplier or taking on the running of the network in the, the short term. I mean, ge generally speaking, I mean, governments don't underwrite uh, an open-ended guarantee of companies going bankrupt, nor should they. I mean, that's not something that I've ever heard any um, a, a, anyone suggesting as a a policy formulation rather, uh, and certainly we'll be taking this approach in the R100 pro program that, you know, the process of due diligence in <laughs> assessing the, the robust financial standing of any bit bidder is, is a sine qua non of proper procurement practice. At a community level, Mr Chapman, I think it's quite fair to make the point that this is perhaps a, a real risk, but it, it's something that that the CBS model has, uh, I think, taken into account in the way that two ways that I've described. I mean, just uh, I, I'm concerned about this, though. I mean, can, can CBS, when they when they go into partnership with with a supplier, can, surely it's it's uh, important that CBS ensures that these these companies are financially robust, because we are we are talking about long term commitments here from people on the ground to to, to get involved with this whole thing and. Um, it, it would be very difficult if, if within a, a short period, then they went, they went bust. Well, you know, I, I'm certainly not going to start talking about individual companies. If Mr. Chapman wants to, to write to me about individual cases, then that's fine. But I mean, I think the, the point here is that the better, pro, the better way to proceed is through the way we are proceeding, which is to provide the universal access through um, a nationwide. Uh, procurement effort through R100 um, because you know utility providers do tend to be substantial companies mm -hmm. and there are indeed uh, I, I think uh, quite a lot of provision made there and end for for example electricity suppliers need to have certain financial security in order to be able to to offer electricity supplies to consumers precisely for the point Mr Chapman raises, uh, but uh, I don't know if, if I mean, I, th I have covered two ways, the retendering of an alternative supplier or taking on the running of the network in the short term. I don't know if there's anything else that we can add to, to, yeah, to this. Yeah, th uh, I think just one point I would say is that, obviously I don't know the specifics of this particular case, but the one thing I would say with complete confidence is that if there was a supplier that's been selected as a result of, com of a Community Broadband Scotland project, it would have been it would have been as a result of a procurement process that would have looked at <coughs> financial viability and a whole range of other things about the company in question. So it's not a case of CBS alighting upon a, uh, a particular supplier and doing a deal with them. All of these projects, even if they're fairly small scale, go through a procurement process. So There's no magic formula. I mean, you know, even the biggest banks got into financial difficulty. It wasn't bankruptcy, but I mean, frankly, it may not have been too far off from practical insolvency. I mean, there is no means on earth that governments can provide some sort of magic cure for, for these eventualities. I think what's sensible is the procurement process, as I've described, as Mr. McGee has, has supplemented, takes account of that. And, of course, it vets and asks each company entering into the procurement process to fill in um, a certain documentation designed to ensure that uh, the, the risk which Mr. Chapman has fairly highlighted is, is one that's minimised and mitigated. The next question is from Stuart. Uh, thank you, convener. The question might be longer than the answer needs to be. Let me just signal that. Um, the the R one the R uh, uh, project almost certainly is going to mean that 
a proportion of the existing copper just isn't good enough to deliver uh, to the last premises. Um, open reach is now uh, separated from BT in a way it wasn't before because of Ofcom's intervention. There are clearly a number of ways of getting uh, wires uh, to replace existing copper or augment it. Uh, and the list I've come up with is sewers, canals, both of which are in public domain, railway conduits in public domain, uh, and uh, in private hands, power lines where fibre can be put along the top of power lines, and government have the planning authority over power lines that are over uh, 20 kV. Uh, so with the whole of that set of options, how is the government working with both the publicly owned potential sources of putting cables through, but also the privately controlled ones to make sure that we do get the widest possible opportunity to put the right wires, be they fibre, be they copper, be they whatever, on existing infrastructure and thus uh, get best bang for our buck. I think the short answer is going to be provided by Mr McGee. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think what we're looking to do is to kind of Anything that can facilitate deployment, we're looking to, to, to try and support. So, I mean, we, we alluded earlier to some of the work that we're doing around public sector assets and how they could be used to, to assist operators in deploying, and that's certainly something that we are we are looking to do. I mean, I guess what we won't be doing through the procurement is specifying you know, no. how things no. should be done, because that clearly is something that industry will need to respond, and I'm sure they'll, be, they'll come up with a lot of innovative proposals for how they might deliver and deploy fibre. But I think the point that you raise about copper, increasingly it's going to struggle in parts of the country to deliver what we want it to. And I think that was a message that um, was recognised actually in the recent discussions that we've been having with OpenReach. Sorry, can I just follow up on that? I mean, certainly uh, across rural Scotland, a lot of railway lines have got fibre laid to them, and I know they're for uh, signalling and uh, for telecommunications, uh, but there's only a very small proportion of those lines that are used for that purpose, and they have much bigger capacity. And a lot of uh, people that I've spoken to find it frustrating that they can see the fibre line next door to their house, but there is nothing. What connection have you made with, uh, with um, the railways in relation to that? Yes, yeah, so we've had uh, ongoing discussions over a number of years actually about that, um, and it was certainly triggered by, uh, in part, by the, the mapping exercise that we did of fibre and, and mapping what network rails assets along <coughs> railway lines was, was obviously a key component in that. Again, this does play back into um, some of the limitations and constraints just around the reserve nature of this, because again, it's very much cabinet office's call around the extent to which network rails infrastructure can be opened up for telecoms purposes. And also there are a lot of complications around that, um, because obviously you're looking at a publicly funded asset. There are state aid Im implications about opening that up commercially, which um, from the UK government's perspective, until recently it was deemed almost too difficult to, to look at, but I think it's certainly something that once we get a new UK administration in place that we'll obviously look to, to follow up with them and reopen, because it's, it certainly could be a, an asset that could be used to, to deliver telecoms. Okay, and some, one of the other issues that I, I, I personally have heard mentioned is the fact that BT in, the, in a lot of cases have the ability to, and please, this is not a technical term, and I'm not technical enough to know the answer, but to turn up the gain or the power on the copper which would give them a better uh, reach to the far end, and that they can't do that because of European legislation. What, what work has been done in relation to that to see whether it's possible to allow BT to do, to do that, um, to make sure that some communities who don't have broadband do get broadband? Can I, can I supplement that, convener, yeah. by just saying, I, I suspect the convener is talking about long reach, which, of course, can only be implemented if you change everybody on that whole bit of the network. And there are issues around that. Yes, so th this was one of the things... Thank that you for your, uh, <laughs> your assistance <laughs> and technicality. I don't always uh, know the depth of your knowledge, but thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it, so it was discussed with OpenReach last week, and interestingly, they did make the point that they didn't uh, worry about the technology, that it was a technology that worked. I think from their point of view... The issue was the complexity in terms of migrating. There could be a range of communications providers that are delivering services over that infrastructure and migrating all of those onto a VDSL solution is the challenging part. 
Um, but I mean, I know that clearly there will be a it will be a dialogue primarily between Openreach and Ofcom in terms of the technical um, limitations or indeed opportunities that that, that allows. Again, my, my, my final question was that we've had the uh, construction of the Bewley to Denny power line. Uh, can I just ask if consideration was given to stringing fibre on that power line because it was obviously a major route across Scotland um, uh, because I know it's been used on other power lines. Yeah, well, I know we certainly facilitate discussions between BT through the, the contract and Transport Scotland around uh, a number of different uh, transport projects that were ongoing. Um, and I know that, yeah, I mean, we can, we can provide some details to the committee after the fact around whether that particular project was one that BT utilised the opportunity, but I know there was dialogue throughout in terms of ensuring that we did join up uh, projects where, they made, where that made sense. Okay, thank you. <coughs> Are there any other questions? Right, uh, I'd like to... Uh, sorry. I'd like to uh, thank the Cabinet Secretary and his team for giving evidence to the committee this morning, and I'd briefly like to suspend the meeting to allow the panel to change. Thank you.